Hello, Scaredy Krites, it's me, Scaredy Matt, and it's hot critter summer, baby! Them Krites is back in Critters 2, the main course, but this time, the movie's much cheaper looking and half of the cast doesn't return. After the delight that was Critters, my expectations for Critters 2, the main course, were sky high, and boy, they really should not have been. While it's not a total waste, it gets the tone way wrong. In the original, the Critters were portrayed as genuine threats. The original Critters might not have been particularly scary, but the Critters were a credible threat within the fiction of the movie. Critters 2 goes for more of the kids movie vibe, usually? Except when it super doesn't. The Krites have way more comic relief scenes where they do something wacky. Wackiness is the word of the day because nobody in Critters 2 behaves like any person would in this situation or any situation. If it weren't for some delightful moments of gruesome gore and some truly embarrassing nudity, you'd be forgiven for thinking this was a movie exclusively for preteens. The movie opens strong. The bounty hunters from the first Critters, now named Ugg and Lee, which gives you a taste of this movie's humor sensibilities, are hunting some ooey gooey wet puppets, yum yum, on a space planet, only for one of them to remove their helmet, and it's Charlie! Which I guess would have been a more surprising reveal had Lee not spent a large portion of the first movie disguised as Charlie. But it's the real Charlie! He lives with the bounty hunters now! He's a bona fide bounty hunter, and it's given him a sense of purpose that has allowed him to conquer his alcoholism. It's genuinely sweet how much Ugg and Charlie seem to care about one another in this movie. It's one of the one of the strongest elements of Critters 2. Hey, hey, uh, you wouldn't just leave me on Earth, would you? Charlie, bounty hunter. Incoming message from the big giant head, there's still Krites on Earth and nobody noticed for a few years. Go kill them Krites or you're not going to get paid for all the frozen aliens you got on the ship. The Krites in question are a batch of eggs, which trade hands a few times in a needlessly convoluted and pointless storyline. Wesley, a bad boy teen, brings them to surly antique dealer Quigley, who, for some reason, trades them for a case of beer and a bunch of Playboy magazines. And then Quigley sells half of the eggs to the local church to use as Easter eggs for 20 bucks in 1988 money, which is about $45 now. Hey lady, just go to the fucking grocery store and buy some eggs for like $2. That feels like a weird choice to me, but okay. The idea that critter eggs are treated like Easter eggs and handed out to children definitely ups the ante and would, in theory, be a good way to make the critters even more dangerous in this movie. And they do nothing with this idea. Nothing. Literally, one child takes a critter egg home and the critter is just stepped on by her dad for a goof. Why, why are the critters so dangerous if you can just step on them so easily that you wouldn't even know you were doing it? And who's that arriving on the bus? It's that good old blockhead Bradley Brown, now sporting a very 80s mullet. I genuinely thought he'd been recast, but no, it's still Scott Grimes, the actor from the original Critters. Everyone in town hates this kid's fucking guts because his stories about the Critters tore the town apart in some way that is never really explained. They just hate this kid because he claimed that he saw aliens. Also, on the same night that he claimed to see aliens, everyone in town saw two shape-changing aliens rampage around with sci-fi weapons, but okay, sure, fine, whatever, fine. Brad immediately gets into a fight with Wesley when he gets too fresh with Megan, who is... That's just Maggie Mayfish. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me that's not Maggie Mayfish. She's Brad's love interest in this movie, and I do not buy it. She looks significantly older than him because actor Leanne Curtis is six years older than Scott Grimes, which, you know, wouldn't be a big deal in a lot of movies, but when one of the actors is 17, it sure makes a big difference. She's also got like a foot on him, and it just, it just feels like a weird pairing to me. Also, when she says she's a reporter for the local newspaper, Brad makes this remark. Kind of like a Jimmy Olsen with breasts. That is just so needlessly awkward. Who would say that? Because obviously, Jimmy Olsen is the Daily Planet's photographer. He's a photojournalist. Lois Lane is the star reporter. And in most depictions, already has breasts. You blew it, Brad. You blew it. Also of note in this scene, Eddie Deason as the manager of The Hungry Heifer, whose theme song you will hear a lot in this movie. In Critters 1, the song you hear a lot is The Spirit of the Night, performed by Terrence Mann. In character is Johnny Steele. The, 
The Hungry Heifer song is yet another reminder of how weirdly childlike the sense of humor of this movie is. See also Brad's grandmother who he's in town to see who just wants everybody to eat yucky vegetables. Blah. Fresh vegetables are high in fiber. Blech. P.U. Brad's family left town and now lives in Kansas City, presumably because of the critter stink that tore the town apart. Speaking of, we're reintroduced to Sheriff Harv, now played by Barry Corbin rather than M. Emmett Walsh. And, you know, the character's a little different now. In the first movie, he was the surly, physically unimposing sheriff of a small town who didn't see a lot of action. In the sequel, He's a rootin' tootin' gunslinger in the last line of defense between man and critter. These two men are playing the same character, except the one on the right is meant to be older and having let himself go. That's the choice. Harv was voted out in a landslide during the critter fallout, so that's good to know. Sheriff of Grover's Bend is an elected position, and you can't just appoint yourself sheriff and then, when you get sick of being sheriff, toss your badge to some guy with no training to become the new sheriff. Good to know. I'm glad the movie established that. Anyway, the new sheriff is having trouble with his Easter Bunny costume at the church's annual Easter egg hunt, and the critters eat his dick. He's pushed through a window, so now the main guys know that the critters are back. Also, the critters eat Quigley's dog in a shocking betrayal of the first film's values. Our heroes, Megan and Brad, go to Harv to get help. They need his help because of all of the useful stuff he did in the first movie. Harv leaves town so that he can come back later and redeem himself. Meanwhile, the bounty hunters have landed in a field where they presumably didn't have to get a permit to shoot, and one of them finds Wesley's abandoned Playboys so that Lee can transform into a sexy lady, and Lee's clothes explode because her breasts get too big. Who is this movie for? Also, there's a fun little sight gag where Lee has a staple in her tummy. I'm using female pronouns for Lee because in one scene, Ugg mentions that Lee's constant transformations are because she hasn't found a body that fit yet. According to IMDb, in a deleted scene, Lee explains she'd been looking for a female body the whole time. But the film also contradicts this when she transforms into Eddie Deason, perhaps the greatest downgrade in history. No more crates. and then almost into Freddy Krueger, but Charlie ruins everything by getting her to transform back into Roxanne Kernahan. We could have Freddy in this movie. It's made by New Line Cinema. They had the rights. That's why the standee's there in the first place. And now, a reading from Roxanne Kernahan's IMDb profile. <coughs> <coughs> Stunningly lovely, vibrant, and extremely well-built, statuesque, blonde beauty, Roxanne Kernahan, greatly enlivened a handful of hugely enjoyable late 80s horror science fiction and exploitation pictures with her exceptionally attractive looks, bubbly, appealing, and vivacious personality, and considerable sex appeal. Cool! Cool! So the critters are back and the, and the whole town is all a flutter and they congregate in the church to yell at each other until they're interrupted by Sheriff Harv shooting his pistol up in the air like people do in movies, but nobody would do in real life, obviously, because it's really dangerous and dumb. Harv has decided he's sheriff again and also changed his mind and came back to town for reasons that the film does not care to explain. Also, Lee gets killed so that they don't have to pay Roxanne Kernahan anymore, and Ugg is depressed about it and refuses to transform out of his goo face mode. So the town's got a plan. They're gonna get the critters into the hungry heifer factory, and then they can rig it with dynamite to totally explodify them. They set up big fans that blow meat smell so the critters will make their way to the factory even though the critters don't have noses. Until the wind changes direction and makes them go back to the church where all the kids are, oops. Then a big critter is like, you know what, fuck this, let's go get the cheeseburgers because the cheeseburgers don't got bones in them. And the critters are like, yeah, okay, that makes sense actually. And they turn around again. Turns out the big critter is Ugg, who can transform into a critter without damaging his clothes. But when Lee grows breasts, unfortunately, none of this does anything because you can explode a critter, but you can't explode the critter ball. The critters have become a ball. The ball is back, baby. They roll over a guy and eat half of him, exposing his spine, and it rules. This is the movie with jokes about yucky vegetables. Who is this movie for? Also, this scene with the critter ball was parodied on a shitty episode of The Simpsons, weirdly enough. The critter ball is on its way to fangoriously devour the children of Grover's Bend until Charlie suicide bombs it with the alien spaceship. 
To celebrate Charlie's sacrifice, Ugg takes Charlie's appearance to become the new Charlie. Goodbye, Brad. Bye, Charlie. I mean, Ugg. Charlie. We'll never forget what you did for us, Charlie. Your meaningful sacrifice and its conclusive narrative weight. Anyway, Charlie's still alive. He was fine. On his way out of town, uh, with Harv for some reason, Brad says goodbye and smooches Megan, presumably while standing on a milk crate or something. Ugg flies away Poochie style, and Harv tosses his badge to Charlie, who I guess is the sheriff now. Well, that was a lot of things that happened. The critters sure got up to some wacky hijinks this time. How about you, Bobby? You got any hijinks going on? What? You talking to me? Yeah, you got any... You doing any wacky scenarios? Me? No, not really. Why? Isn't that like your whole thing? Like every video, something wild and wacky happens to you? No, Maddie. my whole thing is that I'm a bit you thought of while under the influence of marijuana edibles. And also, I am the star of the channel. Okay, well, it's kind of an anticlimax. Well, maybe don't expect me to dance on command like your little trained monkey next time. How about that? 